Thanks. We'd like to get started so that we don't run too much overtime. So uh, with those who are still in line, kind of bring the line inside here so you can hear what's going on and just bring everybody on the outside in and okay and then uh, hopefully the, 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 the internal sounds from chomping on these sandwiches won't interfere with your external sensitivity. Um, it's, it's, it's great fun for me to have Dave Haberman come here today. I've known him for several years and he's a very interesting person. He's, uh, he's an engineer, he's worked with NASA, but he's now involved in what, in, a, in he's involved in something that was supposed to be a great dream and I think, I don't know how many people are actually doing it now, but if you remember when the Cold War ended, the idea was that we were going to convert all of our weapons technology into peaceful uses. And uh, if you're like me, I don't see many of them around. <laughs> they, uh, they just didn't seem to materialize. But Dave got involved in looking at aspects of technology that had been developed under the military and at NASA and licensed those things for peacetime use. And he's actually done it. And what he's going to talk about today is the hydrogen in infrastructure. That is to say, a new energy delivery system which we'll be experimenting with, which is being experimented with now, but which is going to be looked at as a, as a real possibility for replacement of fossil-based fuels and probably other kinds of energy delivery systems that we're using now, like nuclear, that are, that are causing us a lot of difficulty. Dave's been involved in, so what he did was he bought sensor technology. Sensor technology is the kind of technology that you wake up in the morning and say, God, I wonder what's out there. And these sensors can tell you. It's highly polluted today. Or, my God, you know that huge hydrogen tank we got in there? I think there's a leak. <laughs> so, having gotten involved in this, he's gotten involved as a consequence in a lot of other aspects of sensor technology, including uh, areas where they're doing um, a radiation pollution cleanup and that sort of thing. So, uh, I think without backing off too long, uh, I'll just tell you I think you're in for a treat. Afterward, uh, I'm going to take Dave to the cafe and buy him lunch. Compliments of your tuition, thank you. And so, you're invited to come and talk with him. Also, if you're in a studio and you would like him to come by your studio, and chat with you or whoever's teaching the studio or, or just walk through and see what you're doing, uh, let him know or let me know at the, end of the, at the end of the talk. The idea here is that these are as much seminars as lectures. That is to say, it's really open to you to make comments and question and to participate in this as it goes along. You don't need to just sort of sit there and wait till it's over and then kind of feel sheepish about saying anything because nobody else has said anything. But I'd like these to be really discussions as much as they are, uh, as Patrick, or no, as Keith said, information delivery systems. So uh, on that basis, and uh, we'll have another lecture in two weeks. It will be on virtual reality. So uh, and I'll, <laughs> I'll be appearing without being here. <laughs> um, so without further ado, Dave Haberman. Does this work? I, I assume so. Okay. It doesn't amplify, though. It, just it doesn't amplify. For the, uh, okay. So can everyone hear me? All right. There's a natural, there's a natural amplification. There's a natural amplification. Great. Just to give you a little idea of what we do, as Michael was saying, we're a company that's primarily an environmental situational awareness company. What that means is we're interested in what's out there, what the environment is, and uh, we have licensed several technologies that we use to um, knit together good stories about um, if you're polluted or if your uh, energy system is working and that sort of thing. That gives you a little idea of some of the things we do. I'm going to spe specifically talk today about hydrogen and hopefully it, try to go through it at a good pace so that it doesn't seem too much of a lecture. Uh, type of people who are my customers. Uh, primarily utilities and the people in large uh, 
chemistry businesses. And then the government, thank God, is actually interested in what the environment's looking at. What is our thesis? Our thesis is that we want to have some technical impact in the future, and we believe that, and we're going to talk a little bit and build up a story about hydrogen, but this gives you an idea of kind of what our charter is from um, our little company, and we're a particularly good example of what happens in Los Angeles in the last couple of years, a bunch of uh, aerospace people forming small business. I think you'll encounter that a lot. So who knows what the building blocks of hydrogen are? And who cares, right? No. Does that one out of focus a little? How's that? Is that, is that fit? OK. Sorry about that. I guess it's. Uh, it's a tough slide. You know, I'm going to kill the lights so that people can see the slides better. Is that? There we go. Maybe that'll help. The idea is, is you're aware that there's a lot of requirements for energy and it takes a lot of forms. And this gives you just kind of taxonomy of all the forms that it takes. And you, you'll see right there that Hydrogen is one of them. By the way, all these slides uh, Michael has handouts of, so if anyone's interested in them, they should ask him for them. The whole world is made up of energy pathways. That's what you exist in. And apparently, that's what you're being educated to design to, is focusing energy for habitats, structures, transportation systems. This is a uh, somewhat off, is that better? All right. This kind of gives you a sense of how energy is used. You know, the, res the resources, the resources used, sometimes it's modified, has to be transported and it's consumed. That means even piping electricity lines into a hut you're building in Alaska, whatever. And all those things have results, and some of them have permanent damage. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. And Michael uh, said it so correctly. If you have any questions, just blurt them out as I'm talking. What are people designed to today? They're designed to energy systems that are based on fossil fuels. That's primarily what you use. That's what's powering this. That's what's powering your cars, everything. Well, there are some consequences with fossil fuels that I think you're all aware of, at least maybe, if not in detail, superficially aware of. And those consequences are more dramatic, more pertinent, and more urgent than you may be aware of. When you say uncertain costs, I want to give you a, a sense of why fossil fuels have an uncertain cost. The year that we launched the Gulf War, this country fundamentally charged everyone who buys gasoline a surcharge of $1.32 a gallon for the cost of the Gulf War that year. No one told you that, but that's what was being spent. The point is, the energy costs more than just money. And some of those costs have to do with availability, if you have to fight wars for them, whether or not they're renewable. Obviously, you can only dig so much out of the ground. Whether or not they're, they pollute, or even worse, if they're unsafe. Currently, when people use fossil fuels and they empower their communities or their systems or their transportation or anything else with fossil fuels, that's what you're contributing to. You're, you're, you're producing this stuff and you're producing a lot of it. Um, the one that's gotten the most press is the bottom one, greenhouse gases. Uh, whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat, you can't dispute the fact that these things exist. You can only dispute how you legislate to deal with them.
Well, that leads us to the theme of what we're going to talk about, and that is hydrogen energy. What is hydrogen? Hydrogen is the vast majority of the universe. Hydrogen is what is burning when you look at the sun. Hydrogen is the lightest atom. It's uh, not easily controlled. It's um, safe. It's environmentally benign. And it's easy to make. And it's easy to burn. Uh, a little inverse chemistry for all of you architects. If you take hydrogen and you add oxygen, you get water, right? H2O. Well, this reaction just involves an energy insertion. So when you burn H2O, you get or when you, I'm sorry, when you apply energy to HTO, you get hydrogen and you get oxygen. So it's, an inv it's, a, it's a perfectly balanced chemical reaction. Oops, sorry about that. I have to go the other way. Hydrogen technology is like most other energy technologies. It deals with all the components that you would expect to see. You've got to make it. You've got to store it. You've got to distribute it. You've got to convert it into easy ways for you to access the power from it. You've got to transport it around. I'm just going to hit a couple of the key things, uh, but uh, let me explain some of the terms just so you're aware of them. An electrolyzer is fundamentally a system that takes water, applies electricity, and separates the water into hydrogen and oxygen so that you can sell the gases. Storage, well, you understand the storage of, of gas. You put it in tanks. Usually it's pressurized. That's a fancy word, intermodal. That's a very expensive word. It costs us a lot of money. What that means is that you have to move the gas in through all kinds of different ways to really distribute it. You know, in other words, if, if hydrogen gets to the point where it's energizing fuel cells that heat your living room and run your television set, it's not going to come to you the same way that it was originally stored or originally produced. So it has to be distributed and go through some um, evolutions. We're going to talk a little bit about how you convert hydrogen into making it an electrical producer because electricity is the common denominator of energy, at least how we work. And then transportation, the idea is that most any, most any hydrogen system can be transported using the existing infrastructure. A little science for you. Let's see if we can, is that, is that sharp? Somebody shout out if it's, um, yeah, I, I know, we got a good one. Basically, the idea is that if you apply electricity to a device that permits the exchange of positive and negative <coughs> ions, hydrogen ions, you can get oxygen out, hydrogen out, and your only fuel is water. That's a pretty powerful concept for a battery if you think about it because there's a lot of water available and it's free. It doesn't cost anything. Think about the, the implications of that. Now that you have this hydrogen, what it means is you can actually put the hydrogen and the oxygen back into the proton exchange between the oxygen and the hydrogen produces a differential that can run things like generators. Now we start talking about what those implications mean when you see that you can produce it and you can see that you can actually use it in storage. Well, the fact is all of a sudden 
You have no pollution. You have a safe, efficient, quiet. How many people wish that there was such a thing as uh, pure energy systems that you could use in transportation at home that were perfectly quiet? I mean, think about just that implication. Very long life and what architects understand modular. There's some Hydrogen is a component. It comes in a lot of phases, just like everything else. And uh, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about uh, hydrogen just as hydrogen, but the exchange is made efficient given the particular end-use applications. And what this basically means that if you have a, a, an existing infrastructure, how hydrogen is used now, it's used primarily as a gas. If you cool hydrogen down into what's called cryogenic temperatures, you can actually turn it into a liquid. If you cool it way down, about the temperature of space between Earth and the moon, which is about four degrees Kelvin, you can get slush. Very powerful thought. You can also store hydrogen in other things. You can store it as a solid in what's called hydrides, and you can store it in other chemicals like ammonia or methane, methane and separate it later. So there's a lot of mediums. All right, why do you care about all this stuff? Well, the fact is that if you are a responsible designer, if you're a responsible architect, if you're a responsible future builder of the world's infrastructures, you want to design things that are energized with some kind of energy system that's available, right? Not something you have to fight a war over, not something that you know is uh, going to create a toxic waste dump down, down the street from you. You care if it's available. You care if it's easy to implement. What does it mean easy to implement? You, um, there are these laboratories here and studios where I'm sure you have CAD CAM programs and you can pick out an icon for an electrical wire. And you can hook that icon onto your little building plan and there you've energized your plan, right? I mean, bingo. You, that's as much as an architect needs to know about energy, huh? No, it's not. You have to consider where the energy is coming from. So it's not, it's the ease of implementation is not just the ability to move an icon that you're drawing on a CAD program. Is it really safe? It does it really, is it really economical? Those are more sophisticated questions than they sound like. All right, who do you know about hydrogen? Who's heard of the Hindenburg, right? When did hydrogen stop becoming a useful energy source in this country? About 50, 60 years ago. Why? Because the public was shocked by an accident called the Hindenburg. Technology has evolved in the world to the point where those sorts of risks are no longer valid to take into consideration for using hydrogen. It is economic. It is you can implement systems that are maintainable. And more importantly, and I guess the message I do try to drive home is it is really clean. Okay. How many times has the architect screwed up and the people want to know, you know, what, what are you going to do about it? Well, part of the planning that goes into a hydrogen infrastructure is all those considerations that I listed. And that's what we get because we talked about using sensors. Infrastructures require sensors. As Michael mentioned to you, we get involved with safety, we get involved with insurance, we get involved with regulatory compliance. All those dry issues. But those are the issues that mean the life and death of a project. And, and they are issues that's important for you to, to recognize at least exist. If you're not the one who's going to address them, at least appreciate that they have to be addressed. When you're talking about hydrogen sensors, basically the things that we get involved with are one, whether or not you've reached a certain level. It's 4% of hydrogen in air is what's called the lower explosive limit of hydrogen. And in actuality, that is a safer lower explosive limit 
than gasoline, methane, propane, or kerosene. In other words, it takes less energy to ignite the current fossil fuels that you use in and around your home, your basement, your garage, and everything else, than it takes to ignite a similar amount of hydrogen. It's interesting, isn't it? We also care about leak detection. We care about process monitoring. If you're making a circuit card, there's 37 different steps where you have to worry about whether or not hydrogen is poisoning your process. That's one of, I'll, I'll give you a list in a second. Waste containment safety. We have in this country cubic miles of nuclear waste that are in fixed containers that are hermetically sealed. And every one of them still has a low level process that's occurring that's building up hydrogen pressure inside of those. And currently there's no program in this country for figuring out when all those containers of waste are going to explode. Just to give you a sense of all the things that we get involved in, this gives you an idea. Uh, for those of you that are involved with weather balloons, it's a particularly fun one. Uh, the nuclear plant safety is what I was just talking about, all the way to the fact that California leads the United States, leads the world actually in demonstrating the use of electric and hybrid powered vehicles. Yes, and I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. The, um, the question was, was there fuel cells that exist now that drive cars? And there's actually several companies in California that are making fuel cells. Fuel cells available for the kind of wattage for homes, fuel cells available for electric cars, fuel cells available for buses, all that kind of thing. But that gives you a sense of some of the, this is what I'm talking about, but if you see a space shuttle take off, a space shuttle is burning approximately 400,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen in about two and a half minutes, generating about 8 million pounds of thrust. That's liquid hydrogen. That's a lot of energy. That's enough energy to, uh, I would say, power the needs of this school for the next 10 years. What kinds of technologies contribute to building up a hydrogen technology argument? Two of the ones that we get involved with is using fiber optics. I'm not going to give you a commercial. I'm just going to show you um, a couple of slides. In this case, what we do is, is we actually dip a fiber optic tip into areas of concern and it reacts with hydrogen and you pipe, you pipe an optical signal back to a system that reads it. Why is that important? Well, it's important because you're not using any electricity in the sensing process, so there's no possibility of ignition. So those are the, we get involved with um, building application-specific integrated circuits, which are fancy names for integrated chips, where we actually deposit catalysts on the top of chips that are 80 angstroms thick. Uh, that's 8,000 times as wide as a human hair, or 8,000 times less than the width of a human hair. Gives you the precision of the sensor work. Why do you build ships? You build ships because you, we still build rocket ships in this country. This was the rocket that was built by, built by McDonnell Douglas down the street. Um, fell over about a year ago at White Sands and they couldn't afford to fix it. But one of the projects you all may be aware of is what's called the DCXA. This is the single stage to orbit vehicle that's going to be made by the Skunk Works in Palmdale. Uh, travel about Mach 6 and it'll be a vertical takeoff horizontal landing vehicle just like the space shuttle. The difference is that 
this particular vehicle will be able to, if they want, drive it to the moon if they have such an errand. In two years from today, they will be testing in orbit a 53% model or 53% operational model of one of these units. Within six years, hopefully the first one will be uh, operating out of Edwards. We do all of the leak detection and safety on board. The implications of this are that it's a pure hydrogen system. But even more important than this vehicle being powered by pure hydrogen is its initial configuration is to be fueled with liquid hydrogen. But it's designed so that it is possible to cool the hydrogen down to where it is slush and load slush hydrogen into it. Slush, the slush hydrogen has an energy density that's mass equivalent to plutonium. In other words, you burn a milliliter of plutonium in a standard reactor, you will get X amount of wattage. If you burn that milliliter of hydrogen, you will get a similar amount of wattage. The difference is, of course, that when you generated the hydrogen, there was no pollution. When you burn the hydrogen, there was no pollution. The implications of this are actually exactly that, that you have to have onboard a system that can maintain the fuel at cryogenic temperatures and you can launch in space and can take all the stresses and that's part of what they're doing at Lockheed. So when you build complex systems, it's, it's not again as easily as toggling a CAD program and a bunch of icons. You have to consider performance, features, risk, cost, applications, engineering, all those things come in. Even if you're a top level designer, all those things come in. I would challenge you as you do projects now and you think about the projects that you do and your professors ask you for things like, well, have you thought about the program costs? Have you thought about how hard it is to keep the project on schedule, acquisition times? Um, how long it's going to take to get permits. You know, they ask you complex questions. Well, take a step back now and think about some of the other complex questions that you should ask for. What other parameters should you be considering? Perhaps the risks, long-term risks, perhaps pollution, perhaps life cycle costs. These are things that are also valid criteria for embarking on projects. I want to talk about a particular type of cycle because it has to do with empowering people's homes. And in this particular cycle, it's called the solar hydrogen cycle. The sun powers solar panels that run electrolyzers that make hydrogen that go into fuel cells that actually load into your car or your house or onto the electric grid. This is not paperwork. This is occurring right now. The city of Palm Desert and the city of Palm Springs in the next year and a half are going to have portions of their cities all operating on exactly this cycle. Why Because if you load solar directly into the grid, solar has an unpredictable periodicity of making its electricity. A cloud can go over a photovoltaic cell, a rainstorm can hit it. Its efficiencies and its production duty cycle of electricity has an unpredictable frequency and amplitude. If you load the electricity produced from this unpredictable generator into a predictable energy carrier, you can then burn the energy carrier, i.e. hydrogen, at a controlled rate. In this, it, go. Well, it's analogous. A fuel cell is a battery, where a battery is a chemical, um, a chemical process. A fuel cell is a chemical process. It's much simpler and it has no waste. Uh, fundamentally, what a fuel cell is, is using pressure of the oxygen and the hydrogen separated by what's, ca what's called proton exchange membranes. And in the exchange, 
due to the physics nature of hydrogen and oxygen, when those protons exchange, there's a differential created, and that provides a, an anode and electrode for you to draw energy off of. The comparability with current battery technologies uh, it has been demonstrated at high volumes, 50, 60 megawatts. At lower volumes, that's still in development. In the city of El Segundo at, at Xerox Park is a system that was uh, commissioned about a year ago, which makes 48 kilowatts from photovoltaics and actually runs the mission electrolyzer that it, where the mix is eliminated, holds gas, pressurizes the gas, and actually dispenses liquid gas into a bunch of Ford pickup trucks that are run by the city of West Hollywood. So uh, infrastructure planners, architects of transportation systems, those of you that are worrying about intermodal architecture, this exists. It's, we're taking data off it now. It functions on a utility basis for a current operational city. How much the cost of the Well, you know, the, the, the costs, because of the development that went in prior to the installation, are difficult to segment. But I would say by the time you're finished, it was probably, they were probably about 15 or 16 million dollars from the get-go to inaugurating or commissioning the facility. The facility is a bootstrap now. It requires no, um, no uh, augmented funds. It sells its fuel into the vehicles. The vehicles pay for the fuel the same as they pay for gasoline. It runs the whole facility. The Department of Energy paid for the um, uh, development of it to prove that it would work. Comparable to uh, gasoline powered vehicles, usually 280 miles a tank, something like that. I can't hear you. Well, liquid hydrogen used in those vehicles is approximately, I think, $2, 280 a gallon, something like that. But a gallon of liquid hydrogen does not have the same burn rate as a gallon of uh, low octane fuel. They actually get better mileage with the uh, hydrogen. So I'm trying to draw this into an architect's perspective and showing a few plans. What does all this mean when you pull it all together, fuel cells and electrolyzers and photovoltaics and sensors? Well, it means, hopefully, that you can talk about communities where people live, that their power grid is run off of hydrogen and fuel cells and, and photovoltaics. This is, this is something that uh, is being demonstrated now in California. Hopefully, in the next four or five years, there will be other isolated communities that are demonstrating it. The United States, uh, two weeks ago today, signed the Hydrogen Futures Act. The President allocated $17 million this year and a comparable adjustment for inflation for the next 20 years for providing supplementing uh, funds to uh, empower isolated communities in the United States and its territories with these kind of systems. So it's law. Where you see the solar here powering the electrolyzer, all of, everybody who's a native Californian knows that wind is really the holy grail of, in, in some places. So you can replace it with wind turbines instead. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pollute you with some money talk. All these things happen, all these neat things happen only because somebody lubricates them with money. If they're not lubricated with money, they stay on paper and they rest comfortably in files and people go on plugging their overheads into walls that are powered by fossil fuel. So you have to have people who make businesses and make infrastructure plans that have some kind of business validity. And if you're designing any kind of a project, you recognize that you've got to be able to talk about meeting a budget. Fancy term for that is design a cost. Whether or not there's a return on investment if you're designing something that interacts and having some kind of defendable price structure. If you don't have those things, 
I don't know how many architects you know, but you end up with, you, you end up with situations like this. And I always, I always admire the guy looking at the plans trying to figure out who signed off on this. Okay, a small amount of economics to start. Who knows the difference between an elastic market and an inelastic market? An elastic market means that if you lower the price, it's pretty probable people will buy more. An inelastic market does, means that usually the demand is the same regardless of the price. That's just what those two curves are telling you. If the price goes up, the market goes down, and here it's perfectly elastic, and here it's inelastic. If everybody... Why does this matter? It matters if you're selling homes. It matters if you're selling plans for homes. It matters if you're selling transportation or monorails or sewage factories or anything else. You've got to know some basic economics. Why does that apply to you? Well, it, it applies because revenues are fundamentally the, the market side times how many units you sell. Well, you say, well, I only sell a house once and then I go on to the next project. Well, not necessarily because you sell that house totally encumbered with all kinds of repetitive costs forever, for as long as someone's going to use that. And whether or not they have to buy spare parts or anything else, this is directly applicable to it. And obviously, if you're going into business and you're going to set up an architecture firm or, an, or a transportation system firm or something else, you've got to know that if you've got to have, you have to answer for all of your costs of business to stay in business. Okay, well, why did I talk about that for a second? Well, I talked about it because energy is a business. And when you buy a watt of electricity to empower your garage, or you, you buy a gallon of gasoline to empower your car, you are buying electricity. You can think of the commodity as buying it by the watt, because that's an easy way of thinking of it. And that commodity has a life cycle, depending on how that watt was made. Well, obviously, watts that are made with oil, watts that are made with natural gas, watts that are made with fossil fuels, coal, or anything else. At the end, those are going to become unavailable. At the end of time, they're going to become unavailable. And eventually, it's going to be a loser to use them. So what I'm saying here is that to have a winner, you've got to deal with successor technologies. And those successor technologies have to go through all kinds of stages, exploratory development, and design, and testing, adaptation, and all, all kinds of crazy people and entrepreneurs like me have to make huge investments so that they can get to the market and get the market up enough so that we can recover and make money and all retire to the Bahamas. So this is a common, applicable way of viewing life cycle costs for commodities, whether or not you're buying watts, or you're buying screws, or you're selling watts or selling screws. I show all that to you because I want to encourage you that when you do your planning, to illuminate life cycle costs. Think about what it costs past buying the, t past buying the timber and the nails. Think about what it costs the guy who's left with the result of the timber and the nails, that he has to keep, he has to keep a light burning in it for the 20 or 30 years he's going to own it. And he doesn't, and he doesn't want uh, to have it empowered with something that costs him $80 a megawatt. Think about the fact that every time you make a design consideration, that the third derivative of everything you do is money. And I'll explain that to anybody who's really interested. But what that really means is that when you talk about something like safety, safety is a consideration. Well, what does safety have to do with money? Safety, if you don't have good one, if you don't have a good system of safety, 
you have liability. If you, don't have li if you have liability, you have exposure, and that means it costs money to insure something. Well, why does that matter to you? Well, if you're building a monorail and you don't have good safety, that means you have liability exposure, and that means money. The third derivative of everything is money in all your design considerations. Think about the return on investment, the ROI for the guy who buys the results of any plans you make. It's more complex than how much he buys it for and how much he sells it for. I won't talk about risk too much to say that there's a lot of different kinds of risk. If you're using new or innovative materials to design something, you have a technical risk. If you're going to a, uh, a, new, um, a new group of people that process your materials or process your concrete or somebody else, you have production risks and you have schedule risks. Sometimes you have market acceptance risks. How many people have uh, speculated in building homes that nobody buys? And you have to have cost control. I wish I could tell you who thought of this because I, I don't remember. I saw it in NASA about 16 years ago and I liked it so much I show it to everybody. The essence of strategy is forethought and the essence of tactics is surprise. And what I'm trying to do is to open your minds up to some different things to think about forethought because in a new hydrogen era, if you are surprised, then the fat lady has sung on what you're doing. <laughs> yes, there are. As a matter of fact, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, which is down in Diamond Bar, specifically works with um, the state of California and Sacramento on trying to provide subsidies for um, people that will consider using hydrogen um, in infrastructure and offsetting those against the risks of pollution and the getting rid of waste and that sort of thing. And they make these grand algorithms to try to show that you can use hydrogen now. So yeah, the, as a matter of fact, the state of California is a leader in the country in this area. The, pardon? Considering you're not talking to investors, you're not talking to people who are actually making uh, day to day business decisions, uh, what price of gas do you really think it uh, has to occur in order to be able to force a, um, a serious sort of hydrogen? Gasoline is, actually, gasoline is not the primary um, um, competitive apples to apples comparison for hydrogen. Uh, the primary competitive apples to apples comparison is fossil fuels that are based on coal burning for, in support of the grid. Because transportation, the transportation infrastructure which talks about comparison of gasoline for um, surface vehicles, uh, that's still many years off because it's a chicken and egg. People aren't going to build hydrogen powered vehicles until they know that an infrastructure exists for refueling them and maintaining them. And people aren't going to build an infrastructure for refueling and maintaining hydrogen-powered vehicles until somebody puts hydrogen-powered vehicles on the road. So what we have right now is we have a tremendous problem in the surface transportation world. And GM and Ford play a role. I, I go to meetings every other week in Washington where they say, hey, we're helpless. We're market-driven. You know, our investors will shoot us if we come out with a hydrogen-powered car. So we're a little bit ahead of that direct attempt at comparison. Um, and in essence, the cost of gasoline um, is much more complex than what you see advertised at a Shell station. Because the Shell station does not advertise the cost of the American defense budget to defend those oil fields, even though you pay for that too. So the, 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 the fact is that energy security is the number one reason for defense expenditures in this country. Therefore, on an annual basis, 
we pay about 50% of our defense budget, that's $125 billion a year, to defend our energy sources overseas. Now, if you take that and you divide it by the gallons of gasoline sold in this country, you're going to come out with a gasoline per gallon price of about $11. So when you think about that, hydrogen was a valid argument in 1962. And now it's just a great deal. Well, an economic benefit in using hydrogen in regards to the fixed grid systems which operate off of atomic and coal are, are twofold. One, it costs this country an enormous amount of money to regulate and to uh, caretake the results of nuclear power. Um, there's a little bend of the Columbia River in southeastern Washington called the Hanford Reservation. And if, you, if any of you are windsurfers, you know about the Columbia River because it's famous for its gorges that people windsurf in. Well, in this little bend in the Columbia River are nine decommissioned plutonium plants. And the entire area, which is the size of Rhode Island, is fundamentally a, a purplish brown from the air from what went on just to, pr to produce the plutonium and then the low-grade uranium for the commercial reactors that came back as the back end of that work. So when you talk about laying waste state size areas, I don't know how you can come. It's very difficult for us to come up with being able to quantify that in cost. But the, the fact is that we, every day, from the result of atomic power in this country, pollute um, an unspecified amount of the Earth's surface area uh, to about 11,000 year duration. So when you talk about coal fired, and uh, you really talk more about what I put up earlier about the fossil fuels and the cost of, what's the cost of changing the weather of the planet? What's the cost of um, digging large holes where the leachings as a result of the open pit mining go into the water supply and children are born with heads the size of watermelons? So I don't know how you quantify um, some of that. There is a way. How much is it going to cost to, to decommission and seal the Hanford site? The Hanford site projects it will take 38 more years to close itself down at a cost to this country of about $100 million a year. So that's $3.7 billion. That doesn't count inflation. I guess I need to make the point to you that what I'm saying is not the ravings of a Greenpeace guy. I'm a trained engineer, and most of the people in aerospace today are spending time, just because of the fact of the marketplace, in getting involved in energy and getting involved in environmental work, because we fundamentally don't have industries that build B-1 bombers anymore for us to waste our time at. So, the things that I'm telling you about, they're, they're perhaps voiced as in an advocacy method, but they're based on data. And at the end of this lecture, I'm going to give you phone numbers and facts and places you can call to check any of the facts. And I encourage you to do so, because complacency is the issue. And I guess that's part of what I was trying to bring out today. We have faced a lot of technology verification in alternative or renewable energy. And those are things that are going on now. And these are all the types of things that have to happen. And it's not easily done, and it's not cheap, but it is occurring. Consider something that I think is very pertinent to what you folks do. And that is the fact that three major infrastructures are being built on the planet right now, energy infrastructures that never existed before. In southern Asia, um, mainland China and the Indian subcontinent as um, primary examples, uh, if you ask 
any random person who you meet, what it is they desire above all else. They'll tell you a personal automobile or a personal motor scooter, some method of personal transportation. In the colder regions, they'll tell you electricity in our home. And the fact is that in all of these places, Southern Asia, South, South America, particularly the eastern part of South America, and when I say Africa, I'm talking about the northern Africa, there is an opportunity for people who are planners and architects of the future to think about having international implications of what they do. And those are the places where it makes sense now to port modern technology into those needs. Why should we lay natural gas pipelines in places that don't have energy infrastructures right now if the natural gas supply is fundamentally going to run out in 35 years? It's kind of dippy, isn't it? I'll give you a good example. In East Germany, when the wall came down, they just taped the trenches to put in um, copper, um, a new grade of copper wire so that they could have a better phone system. So they had all these trenches dug, and the wall came down, the East German government collapsed, and the West Germans took them over, and what are they doing? They're laying out in all of East Germany fiber optic cable. So all the East German homes, the first place in the world, is going to have broad bandwidth gigahertz access in the smallest hovel in East Germany. Why? Because there was an opportunity to create a new infrastructure. That's a very powerful thought if you think about it. There are opportunities to create new infrastructures. What are we going to do? What are we going to do if um, everybody in India and in China ends up buying a Yugo? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You know, by the time the winds and the horse latitudes finish blowing, is our air is going to be the color of this gentleman's clothes in a very short amount of time. And then suppose all of those new inexperienced infrastructures try to do it with atomics. You're going to get this kind of. It should scare the heck out of you guys that North Korea is getting nuclear reactors. So why do I do things like this? Well, I come and I brief people who are future designers of infrastructures. I hope that I can pollute your thoughts with some different perspectives. There are some technologies out there that are being demonstrated now that are valid. I would challenge you to think not just in the, the few terms that you're trained to think in here, um, board feet, whatever an architect's parameters are. But think about some of the other parameters I gave you. And think about the fact that the United States just passed a law that is funding the implementation of hydrogen-powered systems in isolated communities. Now, where you'll see most of that, by the way, is in Alaska, where they import diesel fuel in the winter to heat people's homes. And the importation of the diesel fuel is so dramatically expensive that it makes sense to even to put in a new infrastructure. Um, I put this up just to show you two phrases. One is, a definite trend is evident. When you read that in papers, what that really means is this data is practically meaningless. And sometimes you'll see in technical papers a careful analysis of obtainable data. Which means three pages of notes were obliterated when I knocked over a can of beer. My point is, find out for yourself and don't read other people's analyses. And, um, See whether or not, test whether or not any of the things that I had to say made any sense or whether or not there's any other organizations that think they make sense. Um, with that, I'll take questions. Are these all on the net as well? Do they have web pages? Yes, they're all on the net. Is that, um, are, any, are there any um, net addresses in here? No.
No. But I can get that for you. You want to... Um, The implementation costs, the, the front end investments. There's no infrastructure, there's no delivery way, n delivery method. It costs money to start out to put in fuel cells and that sort of thing. Is there a potential sort of killer app that would, that would trigger this whole cycling? The initial application that everybody's looking at that is the most powerful is for isolated communities that have to import their fuel by very torturous logistics. I was just, last thing I was out at Avalon, uh, and uh, saw that they, they had their first generator sitting out, as, so where you can see it now, of course, behind it is a big building that has generators, and you know, there's, here's a place that is only 30 miles off the coast that has to generate their own power. That's right. And there they have, Sunshine, you know, 300 days a year. It's crazy that they're shipping, you know, fuel out to this island to run, and they, they don't have a lot of cars, right? And there are no private cars anyway. So mm -hmm. there are only 30 or 40 vehicles in town anyway. Uh, but they're using houses with fuel that they have to bring over by. Uh, sure. Uh, but it would make a lot more sense for them to have a self-contained. Absolutely. System. Absolutely. Well, you know, the, the, the there's a lot of considerations. The Typically what happens is most communities um, are terrified of hydrogen because they all have one old timer that as a child listens to the radio broadcast about the Hindenburg. Well, we, we've all been, we've all been, nar we've, we've all got the narcotic of complacency. Whenever I hit a switch, the light goes on. Whenever I plug anything in, it works. You know, and it's not too expensive. So why should we give a hoot? It's not too expensive for us. Well, it's not too expensive for us yet. Until uh, all the unknown factors and the expenses really do come in. And the fact is that even to make uh, enriched uranium-238 for the standard commercial reactors, there's a doping that occurs at DOE facilities that cost this country a ton of money that's subsidized. Maine Yankee was just taken offline after a $300 million investment. They, the people of Maine, God bless them, actually stopped it. Yeah, see, it seems like the tide has turned against them. But I think because the cost, because of deregulation, that's going to be its. Well, the, the thing I was interested in is let's say tomorrow you decide I want to run the power business in California, which I guess now is a possibility. You bet. Can you, can you make a realistic business plan today that you can show an investor that says, I'm going to do this all on a hydrogen cycle like the one that you were? It's being done, and I'll tell you the initial method, is people build gas recovery systems over waste dumps because the wastes um, cook, and they, and they, and they outgas methane, they also outgas hydrogen. And there's a company called TerraMeth in, based in San Francisco that's actually built three gas recovery facilities in California where they recover, purify, and sell hydrogen and methane. Um, that having been said, the power of the grid, the power of the utilities is, is, is very, very in, incredible. And just about a year ago, three bio-waste to energy plants in the San Joaquin Valley were shut down because um, the um, utilities made sure that all the people that they had a limited grid access to were campaigned that they could get cheaper energy right. off the grid. Right. So they, they, they selectively zoned around those guys and then put them out of business. But and then as soon as they were out of business, they tripled their rates. So the... the, oh, the, no, they don't think so. the, but the grid is going to have to be opened up. Well, that, uh, well, that's the theory. The theory is that the grid is going to become not just a, you know, the grid is not just a grid. The grid is really a, a distribution system and a capacitive system where information, where energy can be stored and then distributed as it's required. And the problem is, just like the internet, internet's a fabulous thing, lots of access, but if you don't have a server, you're screwed because if you want to do anything of any real significance, 
you got to sit around and wait and pay the phone rates well, and everything the else. The problem is that they haven't set up a model for the internet where you can pay for how much you use, and that's the question is are they are they putting the right system in place for the grid where if you know if you have a cheaper way to do it, you can do it. Right. It says it's, it's it it goes on a methodology called store and forward. The idea is you make as much as you can, as much as possible, and you store it, and then you forward it per demand. Right. And um, whether or not you're doing that information a la the internet, or you're doing that a la a deregulated grid. How do you store electricity? Well, see, you can store electricity in hydrogen. That's, and that's it's free, and it lasts forever. What would be, what, what's, a, as long what's as the objective or figure for the cost of it? infrastructure that would be adequate to kicking off, you know, that would be a, a, a breakaway. Some of the small villages that they talk about in Alaska that are the big samples that are being used, they talk about, you know, multi-year plans where they need a couple million bucks a year, that kind of thing. It's actually quite modest. Mm -hmm. There must be, if you run an aluminum factory, it's a big electricity consumer in Los Angeles, there must be a point at which you can say, well, Jesus, for the amount of electricity that we're making, the, the marginal or the, you know, the incremental cost of putting in our own hydrogen plant wouldn't be that much compared to the checks that we're writing to the power company. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and, and the fact is that the, the power company has the switch. You know, it's all about control. Who has the switch? Mm -hmm. You know, and the power company doesn't really have the switch. The mining companies who mine the coal have the switch. and. The, you know, the sitcos run by the Japanese guys in Venezuela, they have the switch. When does the uh, fossil fuels do to run out? At the, rate of, at, the, at the rate of current consumption, which is a bad piece of data because consumption increases exponentially, the, the, the rate of current consumption is fossil fuels will, will run out on this planet in the next 85 years. But well, right, well, coal, the, the, well, coal, right. I'm, I'm thinking of the existing infrastructure, right? The deep coal reserves, um, uh, the deep coal reserves are, um, are are something else. As it gets harder to get, the cost is going to go way up, and that's when we're going to have to find another. Hard. More efficient at extracting energy from it too. I mean, that does get a bit complicated. Can I ask a physics question? Sure. Because it's just um, hydrogen. Solid hydrogen is a metal, right? But under what conditions can you have solid hydrogen? Well, if you if you mechanically impossible, it's almost impossible. You can have slush hydrogen. That's what I was asking. And um, at four degrees Kelvin, you have stable slush hydrogen. And I was um, I probably shouldn't have. That was a bit much, but I had to say it. This, the four degrees Kelvin is the temperature of interstellar space. In other words, you have to leave the, the, stellar, the solar system and get out of the solar wind to have four degrees. Um, it's real cold. <laughs> but physics fundamentally falls apart right around there. Because yeah. um, you, can't, you, you can't extract energy fast enough to make up for other atomic changes. So, um, but we have. Yeah. Well, they deliver, yeah, one watt at two Kelvin for 200 nanoseconds. Yeah, I mean, but that's not a steady state hydrogen system. That's a, that's a peculiarity. I was thinking even in terms of the spacecraft, you know, all you have to basically keep something out of the sun to make it cold, right? If you can just insulate it from the sun side. Well, right, yeah. It, 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 amongst other things, that is a big deal. But, you, but actually, the, um, um, the, the UV, UV reflectance, once you're in orbit, is um, pretty easy. That's amazing. Hydrogen sunshine. Yeah, it's a cool idea. <laughs> well, I hope it wasn't too uh, technical for them. No, no, I think it's fine. Fine. Yeah, yeah. That was great. So, who, who, uh, so I guess we're done. Thank you. Do you, uh, do you